Yeah, well, welcome to today's book talk um, on the history and memory of the Białowieża forest, one of the last, or probably the last remaining thicket in Europe. Um, my name is Friedrich Kain, and um, as one of the redactors of the online platform HPS CC, I have the, 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 the pleasure and the honor to moderate today's session, which is um, jointly organized by our platform and the, the uh, Chorus, Chorus uh, Network. Um, today we will um, not hear about one, but two books. Um, the first one is called uh, Biao Vierja, uh, Primeval Forest, Nature and Culture in the 19th Century, published in 2020 um, by Anastasia Fedotova, who I believe uh, joins us from St. Petersburg, and Tomasz um, Samoylik from Biao Vierja, who was supposed to be here but could not join us. Um, um, they published this volume together with uh, Piotr Daszkiewicz and uh, Ian D. Rotherham. And the second book we um, will hear about was published in 2017, um, still recent, by Thomas Bohn and uh, Markus Czoska from Gießen, um, with, together with um, Alexander Dalewski from Minsk right now, I believe. Um, but yeah. Um, and that book uh, bears the title Wiesent Wildnis and Welterbe und Welterbe Geschichte des polnisch weißrussischen Nationalparks von Jawowieża, or in English, um, my yeah, probably poor translation, by Bison Wilderness and World, World Heritage, a history of the Polish Belarusian National Park, Jawowieża. Um, I'm happy that the four of you um, found the time and um, yeah, the means <laughs> to join us for today's discussion. Um, I have now mentioned several names, um, but one is still to come. I uh, warmly welcome also Javad Daer from Paris, who will comment on both books for us. Um, yeah, before we get to that, uh, let me now shortly lay out our schedule. We will um, start with presentations on both books. Uh, we'll start with um, the first mentioned, and we'll then have Jawad's uh, commentary. Um, each of these presentations will take 10 to 15 minutes. And um, following the commentary, um, the authors uh, shall have the opportunity to shortly reply uh, before we enter an open general discussion, which will may take us um, as long as we we want, I think somewhere um, um, in the um, when 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 I, when I signed up for this, um, I, I found um, that this is planned scheduled for four hours. So um, buckle up. <laughs> we will um, start with um, Anastasia's presentation. Anastasia is a senior researcher at uh, the Saint Petersburg branch of the Institute for the History of Science and Technology of the Russian Academy of Sciences. And um, without yeah, further ado, I um, hand over to you. Um, and I guess Jan, who will um, take care of the presentation. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. Thank you, Friedrich. Um, as uh, Friedrich said, we are four co-author. And my part, my part as a historian who works in St. Petersburg was to provide Russian sources. And as a, historian, as a historian of science, I paid special attention to the scientific publication and research conducted on Belavieja forest and European bison in the long 19th century. Uh, nowadays, Belavieja is divided between uh, Poland and Belarus. Uh, Jan, please show the map. It's second. Um, thank you. Uh, why it is important for the history of science? It is one of the oldest uh, protected areas in Europe, 
And today it is the only forest in the European lowlands which never was entirely cut and its soil was never plowed up, except small plots and except some nasty operations that administration of Polish state forest doing for last few years. Uh, the vegetation of Bilaveja forest established after the last glaciation, the landscape persists until modern time with hundreds and thousands of species of animal plants and fungi. And above all, it is famous of, because of European bison. Between the mid 18th and uh, early 20th century, Bilaveja forest was the last refugium of the lowland European bison. When Tomasz Samuel offered me to join his study of Bilaveja forest history, my first reaction was excitement. Famous Bilaveja forest, European bison, the special, the species that were exterminated in the wild and then restituted. My second reaction was, wait, there were no great naturalists in the 19th century. Uh, who produce any massive research of Bilaveja forest or European bison. Just small pieces here and there and some little known professors or even amateurs. And besides, there was a lot of legend, inaccurate, unverified information, which were repeated by many authors. But after a while, after few months, I changed my mind again. I realized that those little known naturalists and amateurs deserved more attention and I should thank Tomasz, Piotr and other my collaborators for that. We, want, we managed to find more and more interesting plots in history of study of Bilaveja forest and European bison. And I believe those plots and pieces are important for the history of science, for environmental history, and even for today, for today practice of nature conservation. Now I will very briefly explain the structure of the book. Please show the next slide. And uh, I will give very short comments on the most interesting scientific research that we discuss in those chapters. After the heated discussion, we divided the long 19th centuries, century into periods in accordance with the governmental agencies that was responsible for Bilaveja forest management. In every chapter, uh, that devoted to one of those periods, uh, we raised four topics, uh, historical background, environmental impact, cultural heritage, and works of naturalists and uh, travelers. Uh, please, next slide. Uh, chapter three, uh, the next one. Uh, chapter three is a kind of introduction and it describes period until 1795, the third partition of Poland. And for this period, the most important naturalist uh, was Jean-Emmanuel Gilbert, a professor at the College de Medicine in Lyon. He was invited to Grodna by King Stanislav August Ponitovsky. He lectured in medicine and natural history in the Royal Medical School in Grodna. He created Grodna Botanical Garden. Actually, the photo um, depict Julibert uh, Monument in Grodna at the very place where the garden was situated in the 19th century. Uh, Julibert published a few works on Lithuanian forest on the flora and fauna including description of European bison. Uh, Julibert's uh, bison description were used by other naturalists. And first of all, we should name Georges Buffon and Georges Cuvier. In this way, Julibert's account became the main source of information on European bison anatomy, food preferences, and behavior for few decades. For sure, it's not free from mistakes, but whatever. It was the first description uh, of the bison made in a according to scientific standards of his time. For example, Carl Linne's description of this species in his 10th edition of Systema Natura 
uh, was limited by one line. Uh, please, the next uh, slide. Uh, in fact, there was also very interesting description of the European bison skull made by Piotr uh, Simon Palas, but we have no time for that. Let's move to the next slide. Uh, the beginning of imperial period um, till uh, 18, 1837, uh, sorry. In this period, the most important and interesting research was made by naturalists of Vilna University. I have time only to mention two of them. First of them was Ludwig Bajanus. Uh, and Ludwig Bajanus description of European bison. Some part of his paper, especially uh, Bajanus reflection on bison ecology make you feel like this paper could be written in 1920s, not in 1820s. Uh, Bajanus provided detailed description of anatomy and morphology of European bison, but he also provided uh, as a description of two extinct uh, Bavida species, Oroch, the ancestor of domestic cattle, and steep bison, the ancestor of European and American bison. Bajanus' description was very clear and detailed, but this did not prevent many authors in the following decades from confusing uh, two species, European bison and Oroch, and from repeating the most ridiculous opinions about uh, behavior and ecology of the bison. One of those ridiculous opinion uh, was the reason why bison survived only in Belaveja forest. Many authors state that the reason was the specific flora of Belaveja and specific food preferences of the European bison. Bajanus' younger colleague Stanislav Batis Gorski conducted the botanical research uh, of Belaveja forest and find out that first, vegetation of Belaveja forest had not much difference with other Lithuanian forest. And second, European bison food preferences had not much difference with domestic cattle diet. Both naturalists, uh, Bajanus and Gorski, stated very clear that the anthropogenic pressure was the main reason why European bison extinct in the all other places. But the same mistake about special grasses and herbs that grows only in Belaveja forest were repeated over and over again and uh, at least till the end of 19th century. All the promising development of the study of Lithuanian flora and fauna by the naturalist of Vilnius University was interrupted by Polish uprising of 1930s and by rep repressive uh, measures of the Russian imperial government. Vilnius University was closed. Let's move to another next slide. Uh, for uh, this chapter, um, I would like to tell about uh, forestry specialist as amateur naturalist and uh, about European bison as a museum exhibit. Uh, Dmitry Dalmatov, uh, who was a head forester of the Grodna province in the 1840s, was, was also an amateur natura, nat, naturalist <laughs> and uh, the most prominent author uh, who wrote about Belaveja forest and European bison in the mid 19th century. He produced few paper uh, that were partially based on his own observation, uh, but of course he borrowed a lot of information from earlier authors, local legends, stories told by local guard, etc. His Opus Magna was never published, but uh, its scope copies survived in the archives and I suspect that they were used by um, author of the, authors of the late 19th and early 20th century. Uh, next slide. Another important event of the, no, uh, uh, next please. Uh, what? It's, it's, uh, bah, 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 bah. 
some some of uh, next one please yes this one uh, another important event of this period uh, for the management of state forest and Belavieja forest uh, in this period was the state property and for the forestry science was the first management plan uh, plan of Belavieja forest uh, developed in the 1840s it was the first forestry inventory team that worked in the Grodna province and one of the very first in the Russian Empire. Uh, the management plan never was brought to life, but that's a different story. Uh, the next uh, plot uh, important for natural science of this and also for the next period is an uh, Next slide, please. Uh, European bison as a museum exhibit. Uh, this topic is very rich and I have no time uh, just to show you nice picture, uh, give you reference to our paper and treat our conclusion. Uh, Belaveja bison were attractive for museum not only because of its was a, uh, ambiguous ta taxonomic status, these animals uh, this animal, the largest of surviving mammals of Europe, possessed uh, the attributes both of a native and exotic species uh, at the same time. That's why it was interesting both for the white audience and for scientists. We believe that Natural History Museum made European bison well known for the wild, uh, wild public all around Europe. In 1919, the last Belavieja bison was killed in the wild, but the immense popularity of the species and the glory of the legendary beast made the reintroduction of this animal possible. Otherwise, the bison would be added to, to a long list of the animals exterminated by man. Uh, next slide, please. Another one. Uh, chapter seven, another one. Uh, 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 chapter seven devoted to the late 19th and uh, 19th and early 20th century when Belaveja forest was at site pri private hunting ground. In this period, a wave of wave of zoologists, botanists, forestry scientists, veterinarians passed through uh, Belaveja forest and produced few milestone works on different aspects in of its natural values. The most ambitious uh, project was carried out uh, on the initiative um, of Moscow professor, please next slide. Um, Nick, no, no, no. Another one, yes, this one. Uh, Nikolai Kulagin uh, with uh, the generous sponsorship of the Ministry of Imperial Court. For two and a half years, uh, two younger researchers uh, live, lived in Belavieja and collected zoological material while professor from Moscow and St. Petersburg uh, made shorter visit, visits. They collected, uh, they collected more than a hundred specimens of, of European uh, bison um, those skulls, pelts, and skeleton went mostly to the Zoological Museum of Imperial Academy of Science in St. Petersburg and to the Zoological Museum of Moscow University. Uh, but uh, they also uh, collected other animals. Uh, they made all possible uh, observation about um, Influence on vegetation, competition of these other ungulates, uh, reproduction and sex uh, and age structure of the uh, population, cause of death, etc., etc. Data collected by members of Kulagin expedition later played an important role for the European uh, bison restitution. Among the botanical studies, we should uh, list uh, the research provided by amateur botanists Blonsky, Dremir, and Eismond in the late 80s. 80s. 
those uh, three botanists uh, were uh, only able to engage, engage in the um, uh, botanical research in their free time. They studied uh, various ta taxonomic groups since they wanted to prepare as complete list of plants uh, and fungi of the uh, forest as possible. They managed to collect more than 1300 uh, uh, species of plants and fungi. And among them, there were several new species to science. Uh, the papers of Blonsky, Dreamer, and Eismund are still cited by botanists today. But their study is important also because it shows local initiative uh, not supported but by any big research center. Uh, I would like uh, also to mention you to two forestry inventories that uh, please previous slide uh, that were carried out in this period. Um, but I'm afraid my time is running out. And um, also mentioned that in the 1912s, the administration of Belaveja forest managed to get a vet in the team. Actually, the veterinarian studies of Belaveja uh, bison started few, a few years earlier. In comparison with other big mammals, um, it was quite early. Uh, for example, uh, American bison, uh, those, this kind of study started only in the mid 20th century. And last thing I should mention in this period was a natural history museum of Belaveja forest that opened his doors, its doors in the fall of 1914 during the war already. All this nice development of scientific research and rational management of protection area was interrupted by First World War. I actually don't want to talk about this tragic event. I, we see a couple of pictures and you can read the book and actually the next book, uh, uh, pay some attention to, please show the, the, the picture. Uh, next, yes, this one, uh, the picture. Um, no, 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 okay, stay here. Um, in conclusion, uh, please, list of uh, publication. In conclusion, I should say that our project no, is not limited by the book and it's not finished. Uh, this is the list and uh, also the list of collaboration is much wider than four. Uh, there is a list of our most important already published papers, and I hope soon we will produce and publish more interesting paper on various exciting topics about Belaveja forest history in the long 19th century. That's all. Thank you for your attention. Sorry, I talk a bit longer. Hello. Hello. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Anastasia, um, um, for, for this uh, fascinating material, um, for introducing us to the, uh, especially to the 19th century history of the uh, Biaja. Um, uh, lots of pictures, um, lots of, lots of um, yeah, leads we, we can discuss later but we before we come to that um i'd like to introduce very briefly um the, the three other authors we are going to um uh here now um i'll start with thomas bohn who is a professor for eastern european history at the justus liebig universität in in gießen and he is joined by um uh, uh i think he he will be followed by um Alexander Dagerhowski, um, who um, also studied in, uh, obtained a, a PhD from, from Gießen and is currently working at the historical workshop in, uh, in Minsk and uh, responsible for the traveling Belarusian German exhibition on the extermination site in Mali um, Trastenetz. 
And uh, finally, as far as I remember, Markus Kroska um, will um, uh, add some, some aspects who also works as um, at uh, in Gießen, uh, the same university where he's currently a uh, privat docent, um, is a historian and a translator. Please, um, the floor is yours. So hello to everybody and thank you very much for the invitation. We are happy to have the opportunity to present the results of the research project here to a broader audience. Thanks to Jana Nekashevich Karotkaya, who is in the audience. We are able to uh, publish a translation in Belarusian language already this year in summer then everybody will have the opportunity to read it indeed. At the moment, I would like briefly to introduce you in our concept of environmental history. Then Alexander will present certain aspects of the hunting reserve. And finally, Markus will discuss problems of the national park. So I begin my, with my reflections. In an era which has provided us with a central concept of the Anthropocene, human intervention in nature seemed to be of particular importance. Under the various regimes in the constantly changing history of the Bela Vieja forest, it is possible to identify numerous differing models. The hunting ground of the Polish kings and Russian czars, broad visit, browsing damage, and the expansion of spruce trees. Under the cover of animal protection, the periods of German occupation in the First and Second World War saw the large scale exploitation of timber and the eradication of the local population. The two restitutions of the Polish state were accompanied by a de of the cultural landscape and economic exploitation by the forest tree industry. The Soviet wildlife reservation and hunting territory initially saw themselves as an open air research laboratory and then as a pleasure ground for the nomenclature. Following the post-Soviet transformation as a national park and as a world heritage site, the forest has participated in international environmental protection programs, which promise capital investment in the region and call for the development of tourist infrastructures. Particularly, in light of the final point, the potency of transnational discourses or the agency of nature has become clearly apparent. From the early 1970s, both Poland and Belarus have contributed to wider debates on biodiversity and sustainable development. However, it is only since 2009 that the American understanding of the national park as creating a wilderness for humanity has been fully grasped and nature recognized for the resource that it is. Whereas the Belarusian National Park Administration was still at loggerheads with science in the, at the turn of the 21st century and was seeking to exploit the forest economically, in the meantime, an entire economy has grown up around the unspoiled nature of the region, which cannot only be marketed in tourist terms, but also brings with it international prestige. In this respect, the Republic of Poland has fallen behind the last dictatorship of Europe. From the perspective of environmental history, this raises all manner of questions, not only about the relationship between humans and nature, 
but also about that between wilderness and world heritage. To what extent have human actions impacted upon the development of nature? How have international concepts of sustainability and biodiversity shaped socioeconomic developments on the ground? In terms of regional history, it is necessary to address the issue of the contact zone between Podlachia and Polesia, as well as a category of the Tutesi or locals. What systems of government were established in the region and what were the identities or loyalties which they created? How did changes in political boundaries impact upon national consciousness. If we are to consider the national park as a bridge between environmental history and regional history, then it is also vital to investigate the interaction between local farmers, the foresters and scientists who were newcomers to the region and foreign conservationists. What significance did the forestry sector have in the eyes of the ministries in the respective capitals? What forms did cooperation between Poles and Belarusians actually take? How did the American concept of a national park manage to establish itself on the eastern periphery of Eastern of Europe? Why were the two watershed moments of German occupation characterized by a policy of Eastern colonization? And is a world heritage status, which a forest currently holds, merely a level for the tourist industry, or does it also serve as a useful instrument for conservationist initiatives? I'll come to a conclusion. What is striking from a historical perspective are the numerous cycles which have shaped the development of the forest. Whether these be attempts to construct a model economy, the granting of concessions or felling wood, or calling upon the bark beetle as an excuse for large scale wood cutting. Thank you very much. But now it's up to Alexander. Uh, thank you, Thomas. Uh, I want to present shortly the Belaveja forest as a hunting ground in the middle of the 16th century. The first villages were created around the forest and, and the end, end of the 16th century, a hunting estate was established uh, in the clearing of Belaveja. Uh, this created an infrastructure that would uh, determine the development of the forest in the, uh, into the 20th century. The bison population reduced to, to nothing in other parts of Europe became a valuable and unique characteristic of the Belafage forest. Uh, the Russian Tsars, under whose authority the forest area passed after the divisions of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, became uh, interested in, in hunting relatively late at the end of uh, the 19th century. The hunting was uh, as a luxurious pastime and so-called uh, sanitary shooting. Um, during World War I, the Germans' aim was to convert uh, former Tsar's hunting lands in a uh, prospering hunting and forest estate land. The changes were accom accompanied by such nature conservation activities as a measures on conservation of European bison, as well as exploration of the forest part, which uh, fractional hadn't been affected by human economic activity. At the time, Belovesia forest was considered as a model for a wider German colonial policy. During World War II, the Third Reich's hunting land was con constituted as the territory of uh, Belovesia Forest. The main purpose of 
this, those measures was willingness uh, to create an exclusive hunting land, land for national socialist elite and their guests. In the hunting plan, organ, uh, organizers' uh, judgment animals were the only ones uh, in need of pro protection, where, while the human life was, no, was of no importance. In the post-war period in the Soviet part of forest, on the initiative of Khrushchev, uh, the Soviet nature reserve uh, was convicted converted uh, into Soviet National Reserve and hunting ground. Uh, the forest served as a party elite as a health resort. For locals, it developed into restricted uh, zone. The reproduction of wild animals for hunting was seen as a central task. After Belarus became independent part of uh, income of the national park uh, is formed with the framework of commercial uh, hunts, which are permitted as a selective hunting. The integration, which manages uh, nature conservation areas, has a monopoly on hunting in them and use it to earn currency for regime. At the same time, the, my follow of the Belarus forest history and the special role of Belarus in uh, its uh, preservation and is instrumentalized to bring Belarus under Lukashenko international prestige. Lukashenko, unlike Masherov, Masherov was first secretary of Belarusian Communist Party, Lukashenko is not uh, fond of hunting uh, and uh, rarely visits the residents in this fully possibly due to the importance of this place for the collapse of the Soviet Union. Thanks. Thank you, Alexander. Uh, dear colleagues, first of all, thanks uh, again to Jan Zurman for, for inviting us and for organizing this very interesting um, occasion to, to present our books. Um, in the short time I have uh, uh, at my uh, disposal, I can only mention very few aspects that were um, of special importance for Polish Białowieża and some catchwords about which we could discuss later on more deeply, if you like. So very briefly, at the end of the First World War, European bison, which had shaped the landscape for, for centuries, was extinct. That it nevertheless returned to the Puszcza as part of an international breeding program that took advantage of the brief boom in international and intergovernmental cooperation in the 1920s had various reasons. Nature conservation was undoubtedly one of them, which had gained momentum through the preparations for the establishment of a national park by central activists such as Polish uh, biologist Władysław Schaffer, but had few advocates in the state bureaucracy especially the forestry administration and the hunting community. However, the fact that the reintroduction of bison finally took place was only partly due to biological and ecological reasons because the experts were divided on this issue. In the foreground, on the other hand, was the Polish authorities' desire to create a prestigious project that would attract international attention and help boost tourism, as well as the aspect of nationalizing the landscape which was of at least equal importance. The latter can certainly be seen in a quasi-colonial framework and fitted into the policy of pushing back East Slavic influences by sending Polish-speaking officials and employees, strengthening Catholicism and discriminating the native majority population. The penetration and domination of the local society was to take place not only through civil and military organs, but also among other things through the founding of various associations and organizations in the 1920s and 1930s, of course. On the political left, in addition to the trade unions, these included the so-called Workers' University Society, a quite successful type of adult education center, the Red Scouts, which were associated with it, but less visible in Białowieża. The Przewski camp tried to counteract this with branches of the youth association Legion Mordich, Legion uh, Mordich and the Reservist uh, uh, Association. 
Far more successful, however, was the branch of the so-called League of Air and Anti-Gas Defense, Liga Obrony Powietrznej i Przeciw Gazowy, founded as early as 1923 and popular throughout Poland, which had over a thousand members on the territory of the Białowieża Forestry Directorate. After the, the traumatic experience of the Second World War, it was possible to secure part of the Puszcza for the Polish state in complicated negotiations, but now a state border ran through the primeval forest, the divisive character of which is even more noticeable today than in communist times. Białowieża was now no longer just on the periphery, but truly on the edge. It would basically take until the 1970s after the communist pacification of the terrain for larger crowds of tourists beyond the school classes to come to the region. Then, however, the Puszcza once again became a symbol of closeness to nature and animal protection, even though not all the modernization wishes that had been expressed by the region's inhabitants were for full, fulfilled. Although the region of Podlasie was and is not marketed as strongly as it could be as the other Poland, visitors from outside nevertheless experience in their everyday lives a cultural landscape it is different from the one they are familiar with. The mass massive conflicts over the use of wood and the national park have not been able to change this, conflicts that have accompanied the history of Białowieża over and over again in the last hundred years. The interests of residents, forest administration, environmentalists and tourists were never congruent, but the fronts shifted in the process. Eunice Blavaskunas, uh, who is, is present to today, uh, in our meeting has shown this very well for the last few years in her latest publication. For those who do not live there, Białowieża is first and foremost a myth. If you look more closely, however, as it often is the case with myths, you realize that the reality was often different. Destruction, resettlement and continued breeding of the bison are just as typical of this as the erroneous idea of a so-called nature that has supposedly been untouched for centuries. All in all, the topic still offers enough potential for further research even beyond the human actors and I can, uh, can only propose if we discuss and if you are interested in, in, in these aspects to, to talk a, a little bit more about the aspects of the uh, of bison, of breeding of bison, of the situation with, uh, with wood uh, and, and the cutting of wood. Um, the, the development of tourism or the nationalizing of the landscape, or even about an aspect which might be interesting for especially German debates for, uh, for, from the last few months about a, a, a possible a connection between colonial traditions, which took part not only in Białowieża during the First World War and the extermination of European Jews in the Second World War, uh, where, where, where it would be eventually possible to see some parallels, parallels um, concerning the actors uh, in, in, in the Bioviasian context. So this is uh, the end of my part and I would give back or directly uh, further to, 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 to the comment of, of Javad Daer. Okay, thank you so much. I sneak in. Um... And uh, yeah, but actually just to, to hand over the word to, to Jawad, who is a historian, in the Center for Russian, Caucasian and Central European Studies in Paris. And um, I think it's enough time before you have to head out to uh, not, um, uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, be affected by the curfew. Um, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you very much, Friedrich. Um, hello again to, to everyone. Uh, thank you also, Jan, for the invitation to the, this event. I am very happy to have the opportunity to comment on the books, which I read with great interest and, and pleasure. And it's also a great chance to have many of the authors here. Um, I will use the following 10 to 15 minutes I was given to formulate some comments and raise questions. Um, in this respect, I first would like to underline that we deal here with books which are extremely rich in content and that it will have taken a great deal of time to do justice to all the issues they raise. So here I will focus only on a few aspects related to science and the production and circulation of knowledge um, in order to stick as much as possible to the main focus of the hosting seminar. But I'm sure that the other major aspects which were already uh, raised, we also come up anyway in, in the discussion. 
Uh, first of all, I, I have to underline that uh, we have here two valuable monographs filling an important uh, historiographical gap, since until now we had no comprehensive synthesis on the history of, of the Biao Vieja. The two books complement each other very well. They converge on many points, but at the same time, they take significantly different approaches and provide uh, important individual results at different um, levels. My first point would be on the relations of science and place, and more specifically about the local in the history of knowledge productions. It is, I think, a question which is very present in the two books and also in, in, the, in the presentations we just have had. Uh, what strikes me here is that the two books connect very well the history of a pricelessly defined biogeographical entity, the forest within the limits that can be seen on the many maps you provided to the readers, and the very broad European history of knowledge production. This interplay from the local to the European level is, for instance, exemplified by an object that occupies a central place in the both books, namely the European bison, which serves to a large extent as a gu guiding line in the narrative and ensures the connections with many parts of the continent from Western Europe to Russia and even beyond. The book offers a comprehensive picture of how uh, the Biao Vieja has been caught in complex scientific infrastructures made up not only of organizations, museums, zoological gardens, laboratories, libraries, educational institutions, but also uh, of ideas and strategies, metaphors, theories and values, community of trained personals. Um, they, also, they also show the multiplicity of the driving forces of scientific research on the forest and the evolution of their respective places in a constantly changing hierarchy. The story follows the thread of the turbulent political history of Central Eastern Europe, shaped by repressions, wars, population displacement, and border modifications. Clearly, the history of knowledge production about the Biao Vieja shows that the scientific network was not only polycentric, but also hierarchical, with major and minor centers, close and distant peripheries, defined not only geographically, but also in terms of scientific authority and social power. There are in the two books many examples of this, especially regarding universities, but it would take too much time to mention them um, here. Instead, I would like to reflect on one specific aspect, namely the role of the local resident and society. By local, I mean here, people who actually spent most of their lives in the forest and its, in its surroundings uh, in the process of knowledge production. Both books uh, deal at length with the forest dwellers from various perspectives, including livelihood, workforce, identity. In particular, the question of how the traditional form of forest use came into conflict with light hunting, timber production, and later also with tourism, occupies a very important place in the story. This helps very well to understand how the new forms of economic and or recreational uses of the forest progressively competed and eventually replaced the previous economic activities performed by the local inhabitants. All in whole, we get here a very complete panorama of the issues at stake over the previous centuries, and in particular over the 19th and 20th centuries with a detailed reconstruction of the changes um, that occurred under the influence of these tensions. Here, I would like to bring the discussions toward the question of how it is local, uh, let's say traditional form of forest use, which are very well documented and comprehensively described in the books, articulate with the question of knowledge construction at different levels, a topic which, on which the authors uh, could perhaps develop a bit further. What we know from studies about the history of science and the colonial world is that the so-called indi indigenous involvement in the production of knowledge, especially in the field of knowledge about nature, was usually neither tribal nor inconsequential. In fact, the local bodies of knowledge which has long been in made invisible have recently been increasingly recognized as sophisticated in content and some some very crucial in the development of science. This particularly resonates with the last chapter of the Biao Vieja Primeval Forest entitled Leaning the Past to Understand the Future, in which you raise the question of how knowledge of the 19th century can be relevant for current conservation. Yet in the 19th century in particular, but also during the part of the following century, the depreciations of the natives' inhabitants 
dominated in the context of what in many respects um, appear reminiscent of a colonial mindset with regard to the backward forest communities to be civilized. Um, in the second half of the 20th century, even, the scientists who studied the forests were still mainly coming from other regions and had little contact with the local population. On the basis of recent sociological studies we learned in Wiesenville List and Welterbe, the interesting fact that scientists are still largely labeled as foreigners because they follow foreign interests, whereas foresters, although also coming from other parts of Poland, tend to be considered as allies of the local people. At this point, I would like to ask a question to all authors, whether they might elaborate further on what the history of science in the Białowieża forest tells us about the role of local, mostly anonymous, and partially uneducated, uneducated actors who have much likely taken part in the construction of knowledge through the period, but largely remain invisible in the scientific production. On this issue, I very much like the idea of the authors of Biovija Primeval Forest uh, to include boxes about various local, very concrete practices, such as the gathering of forest herbs, mana grass, bison grass, and so on. In these boxes, we provide insight on forms of knowledge that were directly related to the daily uses of forest readers and uh, which were collected and probably also to a certain extent reinterpreted, transformed, reformulated by professional researchers, such as, for instance, the botanist Josef uh, Rostafinsky. In connection to this, I would like to learn a bit more about which status do we give to this local form of knowledge in the more general process of scientific production since the 19th century. Uh, the question is also addressed to the author of Fies and Welt Ebbe, having worked on the post-socialist years and who demonstrated that the category of locals has been renewed and diversified with a growing visibility and influence of environmental activists having established a permanent residence in the forest. You mentioned in, in the last chapters the willingness of these groups to reverse the top-down relationship which was prevailing during the communist period and to democratize the local life. With regard to this, I will be interested in knowing more about how this process impacted the attitudes of the local populations towards science and scientists, and also to which extent these groups were and continue to be involved, not only in knowledge reception, you mentioned the educational activities in the forest, but also in knowledge production. My second point, which will be much shorter, is about the question of um, forestry science as a specific topic. Um, the books demonstrate that uh, the Biobeja forest played a major role and a foundational role uh, in the development of many disciplines, uh, especially in the field of natural sciences. Um, on the basis of the rich research present in the Biobeja primal forest, we can identify the appanage period of the late 19th beginning of the 20th century as the first time when the Biaoveja received full attention from specialists in forest science. At the time already, forestry science contributed to make the forest ecosystems to be seen as one of the most important components of the biosphere. Forestry emerged as a field embracing the science and the practice of creating, conserving, and managing forests. As we know, since its inception in the 18th century, forestry has gradually evolved in character in response to changing social and cultural values, first primarily connected with the goal of a rationalization of timber production. Forestry and for the foresters progressively gave greater attention to other functions of the forest. Here, I would like to raise a question of the learnings that the two books allow us to draw on forestry as a science and its place in society. And more precisely, the question of what the history of Deovieja tells about the ability of forestry science to be recognized as useful for the public good and socially accepted. Up to a certain point, the books rather led to pessimistic conclusions on this matter. As both demonstrate, in spite of uh, repeated attempts, the plant introduced rational and modern uh, forest management uh, in the Biaoveja has always been a source of great controversy and conflict. Clearly, the foresters in charge of the Biaoveja forest believed 
in a certain efficiency of science. They promoted the idea that commercial rational logging under the control of reliable personnel could not harm the European business and uh, uh, could even benefit to the forest itself. And the two books reconstruct very precisely uh, the timeline of the forest exploitation during the last two centuries. My question to the author will be um, to ask if they consider that the experiences of forest management carried out in the Biao Vieja had a paradigmatic role in the development of some aspects uh, of forestry and forest science, as it has been the case in other disciplines. And there are a lot of examples given in the books uh, in this respect. I also would like to know if they could elaborate a bit further about self-perceptions of foresters and their identifications as scientists. This question is especially addressed, but not only to the author of Wiesenwildnis und Welterbe, who had the opportunity to conduct interviews with former foresters having worked in the, in the park in the last decades. As for the authors of the Bioveja Primeval, Primeval Forest, my secondary question will be uh, on the concept of rationality, which according to my counting appears about 25 times in the book in association with forestry, sometimes uh, in quotation mark, sometimes not. And I would like therefore to, to know what the authors understand by this concept and how it can be linked to the question of the social acceptability of forestry. One possible illustration for this, I think, is a question of um, rationality of the so-called sanitary logging or um, sanitary hebe mentioned in the two books, insofar as this specific form of management played a major role uh, in legitimizing the start of large-scale timber exploitation in the 1840s and came up again and again ever since, also because it is at the earth uh, and also the starting point of the recent conflict over the increasing logging activity in the Bureau of Asia since 2015. Thank you very much for your attention, and I very much look forward to reactions uh, and to these comments and also to the following discussions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jawad. Um, yeah. Um, I think we should not lose uh, time after this uh, tour de force um, uh, with uh, the, the, the five of you. Um, I would now ask the, um, the presenters um, to, to, to shortly uh, react to the commentary. Um, yeah, and then we will um, open the discussion um, to, to, to the whole audience. Um, if you already have questions, if you want to be the first, um, then you may already start uh, putting marks in the chat and I'll um, uh, uh, will then pass word on. Um, Anastasia, please. Uh, dear Gerard, thank you for your comments. And I, I think you will like our next uh, papers that now. In production, not, not, they are not submitted yet, but um, in our next two papers, we are going to uh, discuss the idea of uh, bison as primeval beast and uh, the idea of primeval forest on the example of Bilaveja forest and how it evaluated during the time starting uh, 18th century and uh, then in the publications of uh, forestry scientists and also naturalists and also all kind of author uh, who, uh, who were writing for the wider public. So uh, please wait maybe another year <laughs> and we will answer uh, for your question. And um, as for local knowledge, I'd like to uh, give an example um, which is uh, connected also with forestry science. Uh, Russian uh, forestry science in the 1880s uh, started to develop um, kind of um, its own line independent from German uh, forestry 
explaining this that our Russian forests they are much different, they are uh, much wilder, and that's why they uh, require um, another management. And this management should be based more on um, a knowledge of uh, natural science, not it's it could not be a, a kind of agricultural science as uh, German uh, rational forestry. And one of the point was uh, borrow, borrowing uh, the um, uh, local uh, name for the forest type. And we cite this, this name uh, in, um, uh, in the book, as well as in soil science, Dakuchaev uh, borrowed wall Chernozom black soil. So as well, forestry scientists borrowed uh, people, local name of the uh, forest, forest times. And um, this was true also for Bilaveja forest. There were uh, types of forests that local people called uh, Bagna. It's a, a pine on a uh, peat uh, or Bagan. It's also quite a specific type of forest. So uh, I think uh, local knowledge was important uh, for uh, people, uh, for scientists, for naturalists, uh, for uh, forestry specialists who came from St. Petersburg or from Moscow or from other research center to Bilaveja. And uh, all uh, the writing is, um, um, immersed with um, respect with, to this local knowledge. It's, it's a very nice feeling to, to, see, to look in, in, in these in uh, writings and in their letters and see how, how respected, respectful they for the local people. It's, it was a nice piece of uh, uh, my work with uh, primary sources. Okay, Farida, thanks for now. I now um, give um, the chance to 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 um, reply to our colleagues from Gießen. Thomas, you'd like to start? Yes, I would like. Thank you all very much for the commentary, Javad. Since the knowledge uh, production is concerned, we have to talk about the methodology of Yala Vyaja. From my side, I would like to make a remark regarding to the move of the primeval forest. Because already at the end of the 19th century, forest workers had bega began to bemoan the metamorphosis of the oak and pine forest into a spruce wood. And the reason was completely clear and simple. Two factors were responsible for the damage of the tree population. On the one hand, the repopulation of red deer had led to considerable browsing damage. And on the other hand, there was also an increasing desertification in the forest, which could be traced back to the drainage measures carried out in order to create more pastures for the supplementary winter feeding of the bisons. So we always have, shall have in mind that there is an interaction 
between uh, the mythology which came from the outside and the needs of the, of the population who lived in this area. So this is, is my, my uh, remark to this point. Thank you. From, from my part also, thank you very much, uh, Javad, for this very fascinating questions and comments. And I think I can only refer to, to some of them, or at least I'll try to, 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 to refer to them. The first one, uh, also concerning this aspect of, of uh, production of, of, of and circulation of knowledge. I, I, I wondered uh, how, you, how, how, how I could uh, uh, name this, and I, I, I would call it a kind of uh, overlapping of, of different layers of knowledge. Um, that means that there is this, this, this uh, older layer, this local knowledge, which uh, we, we heard about it from, from Anastasia and from Thomas for, for some examples for, for that. And, and this, this newer knowledge which came from outside, this so-called modern knowledge, scientific knowledge, but they had to work together very, very exactly in some points and they couldn't work without each other. So uh, for, for example, if there is, if, if there is the, the so-called, the, 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 the place where, where the bison uh, uh, was held uh, in, in, uh, in, the, in the 1930s, for, for example, or, or after the Second World War, um, the, local, the locals uh, rather have been the, the persons uh, who had the, the role of the subordinates. They, they, had to, they had to do rather simple tasks. But they, they knew better, for instance, uh, what uh, the, the, what bison uh, should eat. Uh, the, the experts not all not always uh, knew about that. They knew uh, possibly how to to breed them and uh, what to do about that that uh, male and, and and female bison will will, will uh, work together. Let's say so. Uh, but uh, but they, in some uh, aspects of everyday life or everyday um, or, or in which part of, of the wood or, or the or the pushcha. They, they, they would like to, to, be, uh, to, to be present. They, they, they uh, knew uh, more than these science, scientists from, from outside. And similar practices you, you could find in the functioning or, or in, the, in the working of, uh, of the national park. Uh, where, uh, uh, of course, there, there, there have been some, some plans from, from above how it might work and which parts uh, have, have to be responsible for, that as, for those aspects, how to analyze the climate ch changes or which plants w w w will, will grow at, at which places. But uh, all, all aspects concerning the, 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 the functioning of, 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 of nature, let's say, or traditions, uh, had their better place uh, at the at the uh, local uh, uh, population, and um, but of course you have to take into account that all persons who lived there uh, fulfilled different roles. So uh, in, in everyday life, the the, the 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 constellation of power and of of, of control had uh, different aspects. And and they, they changed over the over the, the time. Uh, so that's uh, we we learned uh, as as I mentioned. Uh, it would be better to to ask Eunice for 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 the role of the foresters and uh, how they how they how their role changed within the within the decades. Uh, and uh, and it is a very interesting point I think from not only from a sociologist but also from from an ethno ethnologist uh, uh, perspective. And uh, and uh, and and. and to my mind, the, the scientists from outside who, who knew everything about bark beetle and, and so on um, had, of course, an, an, a different understanding of, of science and uh, uh, as, as the foresters, foresters. Uh, and uh, I, I'd, uh, I'd call it rather a, a, conser a conservative point of view from many uh, of, of, uh, of those um, foresters or, or scientists even. And I think that this has something to do with the development of, of the science from the 18th century. As we know, the development of forest science started uh, in Russia and in Germany, and, and it has something to do with each other. And if you compare how uh, the foresters today in, in Poland and even more, I think in Belarus, 
decided how to fight the bark beetle, there, there are some uh, 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 some parallels which are very interesting. Uh, like the, the, the you mentioned the so-called sanitaire hebe, that that is one aspect of that of that. But you could also find this in in in, in German forests now, uh, fighting against uh, the the, the um, climate change and the consequences for the that that uh, the, the the soil is too dry. So there is there's a rather conservative understanding, and this is this is this is the problem because the understanding of the uh, environmental activists, for instance, is a quite different one, which is rather uh, uh, which, which rather has to be uh, uh, compared within a, a global perspective how to react on climate change and so on with different methods and and a different understanding of of nature and 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 so on. So this, this, is an, this is an important point in this, in this landscape, which is, of course, a constructed landscape. And uh, there is, of course, Bioveja is no primeval forest at all, to my mind, because it never, never existed anywhere a, a, a landscape which didn't change uh, within the, the last uh, few hundred years. And I, I remember that uh, Thomas Samoylik wrote about this, and uh, uh, it was very interesting to see how this, uh, this changed about uh, the... the um, of the centuries, so maybe to, to this point uh, only. But uh, but I think it would be very uh, it would be worthwhile to discuss many of these aspects, especially about the concepts of, of science and place or space uh, in, in, within a broader framework, which unfortunately until now doesn't exist. Thank you. Okay, uh, uh, thank you. And um, I would now ask the, the, uh, uh, Alexander Dal Dalowski if he wants to add something for now, or should we um, start with a general discussion? Open uh, up no, the floor. No, no, thank you. I, I can, cannot add, add, some, add something to, to my colleagues. Okay, thank you. So, um, with a look at the at the chat, I think that the first question has already been, been solved. Um, so I would now um, um, head over to, to Patrice Dabrowski. Um, would you mind asking your question um, in the forum, please? Can you hear me? Wonderful. This is a question. Well, thank you all for the wonderful presentations, and I look forward to seeing the books more closely. Uh, this is a question for Markus Choska. Uh, I'm, I happen to work on the Carpathian Mountains, some of which I'm studying in the interwar period as well. And I'm fascinated by the involvement of these apparent, what we would call today, NGOs or social organizations such as the, 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 the Liga that you mentioned and the other ones uh, uh, during that period. Could you say more about um, their attitudes towards the forest and the local people and how independent were they vis-a-vis -vis state policy at the time? Well, I, I I'd see very uh, I, I'd say uh, very very openly that they haven't been uh, independent and all at all because they have been part of, of the official policy uh, or politics of uh, of controlling society and and uh, uh, the, the 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 milieus uh, which uh, have to be controlled to 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 have a, a rather strong power of, of of the state and so it was uh, of, of course this have been different organizations but the, the uh, liga uh, uh, for instance uh, has been built not only for really uh, 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 defending uh, polish air against uh, gas attacks or something like that but also in order to mobilize much, pe much many people in in a way you might call uh, uh, mobilizing uh, civic uh, or civil uh, um, forces in order to strengthen the self identification with this with the state. So uh, if you, uh, I, I I won't call it uh, fascist in that way, but uh, of course the 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 the. Um, uh, the, the, the role they played in, 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 under, in, in, in supporting 
state policy uh, uh, was was quite clear, um, and it's not uh, uh, untypical that that each political uh, uh, um, field or it, it, each party or it uh, has has its own uh, uh, organizations to 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 work. Uh, I mentioned uh, the, the the scouts, which uh, came rather from the from the left hand perspective. There have been organizations closer to uh, uh, so called national democracy, the Andesia, uh, other ones rather to to to, uh, uh, to the church, and all of them. Uh, had uh, uh, a rather critical because aha and 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 the persons who uh, who, who supported these organizations uh, rather have been those uh, uh, not 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 the not not the local ones but rather the the members of uh, administration uh, for, for for especially administration military which have been sent to this region to have a better control. So I wouldn't call it NGO in, 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 in our understanding of social, social organizations. And it wasn't, uh, 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 they haven't been organizations uh, from, from below, but, but rather controlled from, from the state uh, perspective. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, I take uh, the, um, the opportunity to thank uh, Jawad again, who has to leave. Um, thank you so much for, for, for being here, for, for your uh, lucid um, commentary. Um, yeah, get home safely and uh, have a nice weekend. Stay healthy. Um, and we will let you know about further discussions here. Oh, you can stay a bit longer, uh, even better. Um, all right, further questions, I think. Um, Eunice uh, uh, Blavas-Kunas um, is the next. Um, thank you, everybody. I always love digging into history. So I'm a cultural anthropologist, um, and uh, I, I'm very interested how each of the author might, uh, how each of the authors might find a definition of what is a sui generis local person within their own research. Like, where are you looking for this uh, so-called local person how do you delimit that boundary in a historical record when so many people have moved here, uh, you know, to, to work for the Tsars uh, or um, from different parts of uh, Mazovsha? Um, yeah, like where do you actually find that definition of local in your historical accounts? Uh, I will start. As the 19th century. For the 19th century, it's, it's, it's quite easy. There was still quite a big population of local people who lived there generation after generation, uh, who work there as a foresters, as a, a bison guard, generation after generation, who had their pastures in the middle of Belavieja or in the edge of Belavieja. And of course, to find they, uh, uh, any papers, any um, uh, papers that reflect uh, strictly their own voices was quite problematic, but still we uh, managed to find some their a request for authorities um, and uh, a very funny things was war when, uh, for example, this scientist who went to Belavieja, they hired some assistants and those scientists, they, they describe how helpful those guys from Belavieja were. And th this is very warm and very respectful notes and, it was such a pleasure to read them. And also, uh, as for the last Apanash period, the upper level of administration, of course, went from outside. But there were also some forestry uh, officers who were uh, uh, um, kids of people who uh, lived in Belavieja, they went to 
St. Petersburg, they had the high education he, there in St. Petersburg and then come back to uh, Belavesia to work as a forestry officer. So in, in the 19th century, it was uh, uh, not so problematic to find local people. Then, of course, First World War um, move people, many, many have had to leave their places and this changed everything. And of course, uh, then civil wars and Second World War uh, change uh, situation a lot. But still there are people who are, uh, whose ancestors lived there in that place and they have the same family surnames as like, like uh, for example, uh, we managed to find the list of porches that local administration should not hire for any works uh, to, to, to support them. And all uh, locals who, who now work in the Belavision said, ha, huh, I know this family, they are my neighbors. So uh, there, there were a lot of uh, migration, but still there, there are local, really local people who lived there for, for ages. And this is, this is excitement. Well, well, Eunice, you, you know, of course, that, that your question is very tricky, but um, uh, I, I'd say that the so-called locals uh, would decide themselves who is local and who is not. Uh, this is, of course, not, not, not automatically our understanding who, who is local, but it's an important help for us to define, um, uh, knowing that uh, the differentiating between uh, uh, people who've been living f uh, at Białowieża for, let's say, 100 years, uh, and those ones, not only those ones uh, uh, who came from, let's say, from Warsaw or from Białystok uh, uh, 10, 10 or 15 years ago, but rather uh, co also concerning those who lived there for, let's say, 40 or 50 years and, which, uh, and who didn't belong to the com local community uh, 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 nevertheless, because they came from the village uh, uh, which has a, a different tradition. And, it, and it, this is, of course, a way how, how to differentiate. Of course, there exists a, a certain kind of liminality, let's say. But uh, um, in, in, this, uh, in this context, I, I'd say we, we, we try to call them only uh, Tuteishi, so the people from, from here. And, and it's, it's, it's rather an advantage to say that, the, that our definition is not too narrow and not too, too strong, uh, but, but rather to let it open for several different contexts. So I, 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 I wouldn't define what, what means local, but rather in which context local has a certain meaning. That would be my answer for that. One remark still from my side. I've got the impression that in a historical perspectives, there weren't any locals at all. Because locals were expelled from the wood. Therefore, we have to uh, question for the relationship of peasants and foresters. And as far as I know, the term Tuteshi is a category of Belarusian ethnologists who wondered about the fact that the peasant didn't recognize themselves as national people. So they need a construction to uh, offer them a, a certain kind of, of, of knowledge to help the, them to uh, make up the step into modernity. The interaction of, of different interest groups is, is very important regarding this respect. And Anastasia has already explained which people lived in the forest 
or around. But local or tuteshi are two different uh, categories. The problem of the, the, con uh, the co concurrence between local interests and the aims of, of conservative conservation of, of uh, how, how do they call it? Conservationists are uh, remarkable in, in every biosphere, reservoir, or national park of the world. So it is not only a problem of, of Gela Vera. Okay, the next question um, was written by Janine Holtz. Yes, thank you. Um, so um, I've been following some arguments in the rest of Europe about rewilding and um, restoring, and also in Russia as well. And I was wondering if there are any, um, had there been projects, genetic projects, um, has there been CRISPR genetic splicing done with some of the flora and flora to, or fl fauna and flora to reintroduce some species genetically that have been extinct? Um, actually, um, red deer uh, was exterminated in the, um, I think either late 17, either tw uh, early 18th century. I do not remember exactly now, but it was brought back in the uh, 1860s. Um, in the same times, uh, also Dama Dama uh, uh, was brought to uh, Belavesia forest, but it was exterminated during a uh, First World War and. Uh, uh, local administration decided that Dama Dama is not um, native species. It, it's not belonged here. Uh, the brown bear was exterminated uh, by uh, 1870s. And during interwar period, there were some attempts to reintroduce it. And th those attempts were quite successful, but Again, the Second World War brought uh, uh, interrupt this uh, uh, this uh, uh, experiments. Uh, so uh, now, uh, for the last uh, at least for the last three years, at least two brown bears were seen in Belavesia, and every time it's it's a big pleasure for the zoologist and some, of course, some. Um, concerns for the local people because they, they are of course afraid of uh, uh, brown bear. Um, European mink uh, was exterminated about late uh, 19th century, uh, but uh, there is a problem with uh, re its restitution because uh, of um, American mink. Uh, the strong competition with American mink uh, would not allow uh, European uh, to, to re-establish uh, uh, European mink. Um, during the uh, uh, Apanash period, the late 19th, early 20th century, uh, there were um, uh, many um, uh, red deer was uh, brought from the different regions of Europe and even sometimes from Siberia and even from uh, uh, Northern America, the PT was brought. But uh, uh, fortunately, uh, Asian deer and uh, American deer did not survive in Belavesia forest, at least. We do not have this alien species there. Uh, so uh, during uh, 20th century, some alien species went to Belavesia forest by, by themselves. 
but as far as I know, uh, now there is uh, no project to uh, to reintroduce uh, any species. I mean, uh, when brown bear come from other region, it's zoologists think it's okay, but uh, nobody is going to bring it. Uh, or, for example, uh, there were um, uh, some uh, three species that were exterminated, and nobody is going to bring them back uh, because uh, you can bring uh, three species, but you can't bring it uh, it fauna with it, with the tree. So uh, th th now they try to interrupt uh, as less as possible in um, nowadays condition. And uh, uh, my colleague uh, said that uh, Bilaveja forest uh, uh, we could not tell the, that Belaveja forest is primeval uh, because it, uh, the uh, anthropogenic influence was long and started at least 1000 years ago. But comparing with other places, especially with uh, lowland European forest, uh, this is uh, the less uh, changed, the less uh, Uh, changed by anthropogenic factors. So, uh, of course, we could cry that there is no uh, pristine forest, but uh, Belaveja forest is the best example we have now. And uh, this is the reality. Maybe some short remarks uh, to, to, to your very interesting question, Janine. Um, I, I, it would be possible to answer very, very uh, long about uh, the question how breeding works in, within this context. And uh, of course, these, these gen genetical um, possibilities like CRISPR are already uh, only uh, invented uh, in, in the last few years. But the trial to, to reconstruct, let's say, uh, primeval uh, uh, species uh, uh, dates back to the 1920s or, or even further. So uh, not, there was some international uh, uh, trial to, to, to reconstruct the bison. That is one question in, uh, because there are certain under species of bison, of European bison, but also of, of course, uh, from, especially from the German side, um, in, in connection with the raci raci uh, racist uh, ideology, they tried to, to breed back uh, uh, animals uh, which have uh, uh, which should have been lived uh, a long time ago. For example, the so-called aurochs. Yeah, uh, uh, and they try to to breed back and breed back, and at the end they they, they especially the the famous Heck brothers, zoo directors from Berlin, and and Munich, um, they they try to 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 show that those animals which uh, have been created by this way, they looked like real auroxes. That that was true, but. Uh, um, um, trying to, 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 to look at the genetic material of these animals, uh, one could nowadays find out that this, this has not nothing to do with these uh, auroxes from the 15th or 16th century, because they only looked alike. The so-called um, uh, cattle, or, or in German is, is called uh, Heckrinder. Uh, they, they looked like something different, but uh, they, 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 uh, 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 they look the same, but they, 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 in, in real day, they have been something uh, different. And the second point, biologists until today, to my mind, uh, sometimes are uh, a bit uh, uh, racistic in, in, in a certain way, because uh, there is a, there's a, a constant fight against the so-called neophytes. And uh, neophytes, that means uh, uh, plants, for instance, which uh, uh, don't uh, 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 gr grow at some areas. And when they come to these areas, they had to be uh, 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 destroyed. So that they, because they uh, uh, allegedly 
don't belong to these surroundings, to these surroundings. Uh, that's, that's, that's a question which uh, you could find some parallels between, uh, to my mind at least, uh, to, to the, the destruction of, 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 of people and the destruction of plants, but it would be an, a different uh, topic. But the methodology or the ideology which, which, which is behind this, these uh, um, uh, um, models of, of, of fighting uh, are, to my mind are, are the same. And this is a very interesting point for, for Biao Vieja too, because uh, I, I remember some debates in the 1950s and 1960s where Polish biologists decided which plants should, uh, should uh, be there, should, should grow there, and which one uh, should be extincted uh, to not to spoil the so-called natural surroundings of Biao Vieja. Thank you. All right. Um, are there further questions? Still have a little bit of time. I have one small question if no one else has. Yeah, um, go ahead. I'm sorry. So um, on World War II, I'm hearing over and over again, of course, the destruction of World War II and the forest played a huge role in World War II. And I don't know if it's covered in the book especially, but um, I know many people sought refuge in the forest during World War II and they were hiding in the forest. And um, I'm sorry, my question isn't I very prepared, but um, people frequently approach these locals they frequently approach these especially these forest rangers for help during uh, world war ii and they say in their survivor testimony how forest rangers either told them where to hide or warned them or gave them food they of course when if a forest ranger killed them they didn't survive so we don't know for sure but um it made me think of your earlier comments about locals and about um, the role of the forest rangers in their understanding of the state and understanding of the war and understanding of their position vis-a-vis -vis the, um, the occupation. It's an open question, but it's if you study the Holocaust, these forest rangers are always mentioned in this particular forest. Uh, this was not case for the Belavieja forest. Uh, of course, in, in other places, people hide it in forest, but Belavieja forest was full of Nazi. It was, it was training camp for younger Nazi to kill Jewish people and any, um, any people who helped Jewish or suspected in helping Jewish or communist or whatever. So it, it wasn't a case. In, in this sense, history of Belavieja Forest in the Second World War is totally tragic story. And this is one of the reasons I don't want to study history of Belavieja Forest in the 20th century. It's too sad. I completely agree with you. And um, of course, there have been some some trials for, for smaller resistant groups to to hide within the forest, but they 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 couldn't survive within this context. Uh, of course, also the longer the war lasts, uh, the more risky was it for German soldiers to to be within the forest. Um, and there, there was this, there was one aspect that that it was uh, of course uh, a real danger that there has been some partisans or something like that, but also the imagination there could have been, and and the, and the fear that the, the so-called uh, partisans or, or rather the, the Germans didn't call their partisans uh, of course um, uh, would do something negative in these surroundings which the German soldiers uh, felt like something uh, strange and and even mysterious in a certain way um, helped uh, this this imagination to to survive but uh, 
on the other way around, it 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 hadn't been po possible for for Jewish refugees, which uh, who exist which existed, because there there came uh, some of them uh, could escape from the villages where they have been persecuted after uh, 1941, especially, and even from 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 uh, far away uh, Bialystok they tried, but but uh, on the longer run they 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 didn't have any chance of uh, to survive in this in the surroundings, and uh, I'm no not not no expert for this. It would be rather uh, Alexander Daluski who, who, who dealt with the today with the Belarusian side, where where some villages were burned down even and 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 so on. Um, of course, there has been something of collaboration too, but there's a different aspect. But uh, uh, on on the long run, it, it it unfortunately it wasn't possible to survive within the forest within these three years, which uh, German uh, occupation lasted at least. Okay. Okay, um, Eunice Blavos Kunas has a comment on this, I suppose. Yeah, I don't want to be an interloper here. Um, I'm not on the panel, uh, but in my own research, which is ethnographic and of the present, but also trying to source things from secondary sources from oral histories. Um, the, the start of World War II, you have mostly Polish foresters um, who are not very happy with their ethnic Belarusian neighbors. Um, because they are foresters, they get conscripted um, into the Polish military. So most of them are not there during World War II. They're off fighting elsewhere. Of course, there are still people there, but um, again, the forest is taken over by Gehring, and then the Russians are there logging. I mean, it's a very complicated back and forth history where Polish foresters are not in control of the forest during World War II. Um, yeah, so it's a. Uh, I. Uh, certainly heard stories of locals um, who talk about some period of time of knowing somebody Jewish who had been hiding and then they go away. But you know, these stories are so, uh, so hard to grasp. And they're so also told by people who are now 80 years old and uh, you know, had to go off themselves um, somewhere else during the war, their village was burned. Um, so I think it's it's very hard to really get a portrait of uh, or to see foresters sort of aiding and abetting people within the forest. But I mean, the whole cursed soldiers movement, if you will follow that, um, is also creating this whole hagiography over certain uh, heroic foresters during World War II and after World War II. Um, you know, who were fighting Russians and Germans, uh, but you can't sort of look at or tell that story without understanding it in the contemporary context also. Um, may I answer? Uh, it's, it's for uh, local, people there are some some stories uh, and helping um, uh, it's it's not helping people but what local people did uh, is it okay because I, I have unstable connection uh, there were a few places where uh, Nazis uh, uh, killed people and they left their bodies. And by night, a local peasant went to these places, take the bodies and uh, buried them. So at least not to leave those, uh, those uh, dead people. So this is was the only thing they can, can do. And actually doing this, they risk they, they they were taking risks and uh, now Belavija forest is full of sites of memories and places uh, with uh, where this, with, um, with those tombs so this is too sad story to study actually and uh, now, and there is also one uh, nice site of uh, local people, which also uh, noticed by um, 
19th century and early 20th century naturalist. And not only by naturalists, but also by travelers. And since Abilavedra Forest had a, a, a glory of primeval uh, forest, uh, quite a few painters went to Bilavezha Forest, uh, famous in Poland and famous in Russia. And uh, those naturalists and travelers and uh, painters, they all um, noted how nice and soft and generous uh, local people are. And they, they told this like a, a local peculiarities of kindness of local people. And um, I don't know uh, how to, <laughs> to test this hypothesis, but it's always pleasant to read. Okay, hey, thank you. Are there, oh, just in time. Um, Patrice uh, Dabrowski again, please. Yes, I would take advantage of the opportunity having so many experts on the Białowieża uh, National Park uh, to ask a question about the, the different current approaches to the park by Poland and Belarus. And here I'm most interested in Poland's changed approach, obviously, within the last several years. Um, again, I'm trying to understand what motivates that. And my guess would be that the present Polish authorities are in some way catering to certain local or regional constituencies. So this would be going in a bit of a different direction that was just mentioned, a, a bit of ins insensitivity on the part of some local or regional actors, or perhaps I'm wrong about that. Um, or, or is it just that the authorities are insensitive to this relative primevalness of the forest, seeing it as nothing really special as opposed to being a matter of international prestige, which I think is the, the approach taken by Belarus. Thank you. Yeah, who wants to? This is for today history, is for today moment. I am 19th century. <laughs> well, I think of, of course there is, there, there, uh, I, 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 I don't uh, uh, understand the, the, the actual situation completely, I have to, to admit, because um, in, in, in a, let's say, national understanding, it's not quite logic logical that uh, uh, Polish government supports those uh, people who wouldn't feel, or some of those people who wouldn't feel Polish in a, in a certain national way um, at all, namely the local inhabitants uh, at, at, at the Białowieża who are normally, or not, not normally, but uh, who very often have a, a, a different uh, uh, um, uh, context, uh, let's, let's say. Uh, so, um, of course, it could be understand that the, the, understood that the um, supporting level of the governing party in Poland rather came from the uh, uh, rural uh, 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 population. So, it's, it's, in this way, it, it makes sense that they support those ones who fight for a better uh, 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 economic situation of this region by uh, uh, cutting uh, uh, more wood, for it, for instance, um, and, and and those aspects, um, which is uh, supported, of course, by by many of the foresters too, uh, and not to support those Levatsky, you might call them, uh, elements, uh, left left wing elements. Uh, who, who came to Białowieża from different, from, from, from the cities especially. Not only we know that there are some, some uh, local uh, residents who support the, the environmental goals and the, 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 the appeal 
to 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 even to 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 global uh, uh, um, uh, publicity in order to 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 save this 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 uh, uh, primeval forest and and the surroundings. Um, but uh, for for many of the local uh, inhabitants, uh, these these especially those young people who came from outside and and have uh, they they live a diff in a different way, they behave in a different way, they are connected with each other by social media and so on. And this is something strange, even even though there there, there are a lot of tourists who came uh, uh, who come to to Biao Vieja each uh, each year, uh, but but it's that is something different. So this, this aspect, this, this element of, of a different way of living, of, of, uh, of uh, uh, a different behavior uh, is, is, is very uh, um, critical or very um, astonishing to a certain point for, to the local inhabitants who rather trust those elements they, they, they know for, for years or decades, namely the, the local uh, authorities, the churches, and uh, uh, in, in this way, the, the, uh, the, although it's quite absurd to, to say that, the, the, the uh, administration, uh, even in, in the faraway capital Warsaw. But this is only my mind. Uh, Eunice knows better about that because uh, she talked to, to all those people. And uh, maybe you have a different uh, point of view in this, uh, in this regard. Sure. Um, I mean, I, I want to say that Again, foresters and nature conservationists or scientists have been fighting since uh, the industrial logging in this forest began in the period of World War I. Um, they have been at loggerheads ever since. Uh, but it was easier during the communist period to just kind of say, here's the national park. Uh, there's a Cold War period of, of scientific institution building that creates more opportunities for scientists to be in this place. Um, in the immediate uh, years following uh, the free elections in Poland, um, you know, it's still very easy to work at this level of we need to have this we need to have this national park expanded, and so the national park doubles in size in 1996 um, without much fuss until the whole area is declared a national park, um, or you know, the whole area is uh, slated to become a national park. There are all kinds of international monies available to make this happen. Polish commitments. Um, it all falls apart in 2000 based on this, um, this way of thinking that the locals oppose this. Uh, the locals uh, at this time being both a mixture of uh, Catholics and Orthodox and intermarried people and even some Baptists and Jehovah's Witness. I mean, it's a very multicultural place and it's always been a very multicultural place. Um, and so since I've been going there in 1995, I mean, every single government has been opposed to expanding this national park on the grounds that, oh, the local people are opposed to this. But we can't talk about the local people without also talking about the foresters and the foresters being this strong state agency, um, the strong, very nationalist agency that becomes a communist agency. But there's still all of these elements of uh, uh, foresters as being, uh, you know, militarized as being uh, in defense of some sort of ideal of Polishness, even though there are some, of course, Belarusians who are also um, part of state forestry. Um, so, I mean, I really see this as a, as a point of uh, professional pride on the part of foresters. I mean, the blockage of, of making this whole area a national park. I mean, it, it would be easy enough to do in terms of funding, in terms of other logistical matters, uh, but under the current peace government, it's really become a nationalist issue um, that if the European Union tells Poland what to do, it means there's some kind of lack of sovereignty over the Polish forests. And if you read my book, um, anyway, there are all kinds of details in this book about what's happened in the last 15, 20 years about how this, how foresters moved from being seen as communistic and taking care of all the local people and the state providing people with jobs to this kind of nationalist turn. And how did even tourists um, see this uh, forest as once an outpost of Belarusianness, and now it becomes a symbol of Poland itself. Um, so I, I think that's what this whole uh, talk was about today. I mean, this, this pull of history, right? Uh, which imperial powers lay claim to this? Are there really autochthonous local people in this place? 
But I also want to say on the Belarusian side of this forest, um, I mean, there are sawmills operating 24 hours a day. Um, there are uh, bark beetle sanitation measures. There are lots more old trees there, I will say, overall in the forest. Um, but that designation as a national park doesn't mean total protection against logging or against um, you know, sanitary logging for bark beetle. So uh, it's hard to use one metric to say uh, what's going on in this forest. There are many different uh, types of management on the Polish side, even within state forestry, there are different little protective reserves. Um, there's what's going on in two different protective zones within the national park within Poland. Um, anyway, there's not a lot of consistency. And then we have the whole history of when and where was this forest drained for which purposes and how is that exacerbated by climate change at the present moment. So, I mean, all of these actants come into play when we think about how this forest can be protected or can't be protected or protected for what? Are we talking about protecting this forest for one type of tree stand, for um, animal species? Um, anyway, it's, it's totally complex. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So we uh, should have probably um, widened this and uh, presented three books um, or even more, I don't know. Um, Anastasia's uh, bibliography was uh, impressive and uh, she promised more to come. Um, I'm not alone. There are many co-authors. Yeah, then, then your group. Um, yeah, um, I think with um, a look on the clock, uh, we have now reached, I think, two hours. Um, I think that's for, for a Friday evening, at least in um, uh, in Europe, um, I'm not sure where everybody, where, um, if, 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 um, where you, for example, Eunice, are, um, have joined us. Um, I think um, we have come to a decent end. I would um, again thank everybody uh, who presented here. Um, well, um, thanks to Anastasia, to uh, Fedotova to Thomas Bohn, to Markus Kroska, and of course also to, um, um, I'm sorry, to uh, Alexander Dalowski and uh, Java uh, the last two uh, had already um, already had to leave. Um, thanks also to, to Jan for the technical uh, support um, and for, for organizing, for setting up all this um, and of course uh, thanks to all of you who discussed here so vividly um, yeah so in the end um, I think yeah I can uh, wish you a nice uh, weekend um, stay healthy and um, see you again sometime um, at an HPS CC book talk I hope Okay.